Good morning. Good morning. Welcome to the Montana Baptist Church on the 18th day of September, year of our Lord, 2022. We're gathered here this morning to worship and to praise and give God glory for the many things that he continues to bless us here at the Montana Church for 152 years. Uh, if you were with us last week, we celebrated the anniversary two years on behind, but it was a glorious celebration either way. Lord, uh, as we look to the things that are continuing to happen this week in your bulletin, there's a Sunday school a praise today. We have children in our, in our Sunday school. Today we started children's Sunday school. And it was good to hear their voices singing downstairs. Praise God for that. And if you have children or grandchildren or neighbors, bring them along and invite them to come and worship. Starting on, oh, it's not starting, but on Monday, uh, on September the 19th, we'll be uh, at Country Comfort. Where they'll be doing scrapbooking with uh, Mary and anyone else who wants to go along. They enjoy that too. Coming up on the 28th of uh, September will be the meeting that launches the Dorcas. Do you, the Dorcas chair have something she'd like to say about that? Uh, just that it's Wednesday, Wednesday at Perkins and you don't have to bring anything. And any ladies that think they can come, let me know. And they probably won't reserve it, but at least I'll know a number or two. I have a few that, that said already they want to come. So let me know. All right. Also coming up then on uh, October the, the 23rd is the uh, deadline for the November-December newsletter. Wow. Time just marches on. All right. Coming up then on the 24th of October will be a leadership meeting here at 630. And also listed in your bulletin are the individuals who celebrate birthdays that reside at Country Comfort. Do we have any other announcements? Seeing none, let's then turn our attention to the reason that we've assembled here this morning, and that is to give God glory for the, all the things that he has. Let us go to the Lord in prayer, and then we'll follow up with the doxology. Heavenly Father, we come to you this morning. What it, indeed it is a pleasure and honor to be in your presence this morning. Lord, may each and every heart that is here allow the Spirit to move mightily in their lives. Lord, may we sense and know that your presence is real, and may the presence that you instilled upon the hearts of your children, may it be amplified, that it gives you the glory for all things. Lord, we invite you to be here. And Lord, we just thank you for those who have come out this morning to worship and to give glory and for those who are joining us at home via the media systems. Lord, go through their homes and touch them also. Lord, we thank you again for all that you do for us. And we thank you for your son Jesus. And it's in his name we pray. Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. 
Would you stand if you were able and join us now as we read responsibly number 646 in the blue hymn. Present your requests to God. Rejoice in the Lord always. I will say it again. Rejoice. Let your gentleness be evident to all. The Lord is near. Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your requests to God. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Whatever you have learned or received or heard from me or seen in me, put it into practice. And the God of peace will be with you. Amen. Our first song this morning comes in the hymn book, number 81, Change My Heart. turns up the pressure in our lives. He's making you into something that will be bright and shiny. Praise God. All right. We have a children's song this morning. Mm -hmm. I think in the video I, I caught that Emily's favorite song was He's Got the Whole World in His Hands. So we're going to do that today. He's got the whole world in his hands. He's got the whole
put our, well, we can go to another hymn. Yeah. Number 640 in the blue, blue hymnal, Sweet Hour of Prayer. Scripture today is Matthew 6, 5, 8. And when you pray, do not be like the hypocrites, for they love to pray standing in the synagogues and on the street corners to be seen by men. I tell you the truth, that they have received your, their reward in full. But when you pray, go into your room, close the door, and pray to your Father, who is on scene. Then your Father who sees what is done in secret, will reward you. And when you pray, do not keep on babbling like pagans, for they think they will be heard because of their many words. Do not be like them, for your Father knows what you need before you ask him. May the Lord add his blessing. Amen. Amen. If you haven't guessed with the words of the songs that we sang and our responsive reading, we're going to be looking at prayer. Jesus is teaching on prayer. And the follow-up for the next week or maybe the next two weeks will be the, uh, the model prayer that Jesus gave his disciples. Sometimes it's called the Lord's Prayer. But we'll address that starting next week. But Jesus is giving us instruction. Is it important to pray? You may answer that question. Yes. Yes. All right. You know, in this passage of Scripture, in these four verses, it's the, the Lord is saying three times he makes it very clear. 
He says, when you pray. You know, if, if Jesus says something once, it's important. But if he says it three times, it makes it pretty much, you know, you need to be praying. When you pray. But there's a fourth time in this passage where he's, it's indicating that you will be praying. Because he said, before you ask him. So we got three times where it says, when you pray, and then the fourth time it says, when you, before you ask him. So you're going to pray. Prayer is important. You remember when the churches, and some still do, used to have weekly prayer meetings? Usually on Tuesday or Wednesday, sometime during the week, there would be a prayer meeting. Folks would come together and seek the Lord's wisdom and guidance and what the will of the, of the Father is for the direction of the church. That body of believers. Of course, you know, it's good to be able to bring your concerns together like we do prior to the service here, praying for the sick and praying for those who are in need of special attention that we petition the Lord for. So prayer is important. Gathering together in unified prayer to be able to seek what God has for us to do. What would it be like if you didn't speak to somebody that you love? How about that? If you love somebody or you proclaim that you love somebody and you didn't talk to them, what would happen? You would soon feel alienated. Just this week, there was an example that I saw of a couple sitting down at a, a lunch table. And they sat down. Waitress came over, gave their order, took their order. And immediately, out of their pockets and purses came this. And they're sitting there going like this. Before their meal came, they didn't speak a word to one another. They were just looking down at them screens and three by five and a half screens. Huh. How many times? Well, I can also say when the 7,600 miles we were driving, I was driving, you know, Jamie's sitting over there on the right side and she's not speaking a whole lot. Of course, I learned many, many years ago, you need to pay attention to what's happening front of me. So uh, it was not a whole lot of conversation unless I would say, did you see that? <laughs> <Whoa>. <laughs> so uh, she was over there on the, on the computer, this green screen. Well, anyway, what would happen if you didn't talk to somebody that you love? What would happen if you didn't constantly talk to the Lord? Yes, we gather here at specific times. We pray for before the meals. But what about other times during the day? Jesus is saying, when you pray, Jesus is teaching the disciples here in this particular passage of Scripture. Now, this is not a checklist. You know, oh, well, we've got to do this, you know, humble ourselves, and, you know, don't want to. You know, Jesus is giving a, a very good lesson here. And like every good teacher, they will explain the problem and then offer a solution. And that's what Jesus is doing here. In, in verses 5 and verses 7 is the problem. But in verses 6 and verse 8 is the solution. Here, Jesus says, when you pray, you shall not be like the hypocrites. Hmm. Now, it's probably Jesus is addressing those individuals who are the religious leaders. Not all of them now, but some of them. But even Jesus said later on in Matthew, But woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you have shut up the kingdom of heaven against men. 
For you realize you neither go in yourselves or nor allow those who are entering in go in. So in other words, Jesus is calling them hypocrites. And this is the application here that is that is believed that Jesus was, don't be like them. For they love to pray standing in the synagogues. Standing in the synagogues. And on the corners of the streets. Now, whenever you have that, that word corners, there, it just blew my mind a little bit. You know, it caused me to think, you know, it's one thing to, be a, to pray on the street. But if you're praying at a corner, you've got traffic coming from all different directions at the corners. These individuals, whether they were in the synagogue or whether they were standing on the street corners, they were praying out loud, bringing attention to themselves. Look at me, I am praying. And not too many verses before that, Jesus was giving the explanation on, on giving. That if you're going to give, don't blow the trumpet and then dump your money in the, in the coffers. Do it quietly and secretly. But these individuals, even their posture was something that needed to be taken attention of. Now, standing for prayer, there's nothing wrong with that. I've been in churches already where they knelt. Come time for prayer, you turn that around out of your out of your pew and you you knelt in the pew, you know. There's nothing wrong with that. Standing or kneeling, it's a condition of the heart. Whether you come, you stand before the Lord in humbleness, or if you're kneeling, there's and because you're humble before a sovereign God, there's nothing wrong with that either. But these individuals, Jesus was proclaiming that it was a reflection of their heart. The reason they were doing that. It was pride. Pride means, you know, look at me. I am a great prayer. Oh my. Jesus says, don't be like that. But they have seen that they may be seen by men, that they may be seen by others. Jesus says, they have their reward. Mm -hmm. The glory that they get from, oh, that's a good job. That's a good job. You pray so nice. Of now, there's nothing wrong with complimenting someone on a, a heartfelt, sincere prayer. Right. There's nothing wrong with that. But these individuals were doing it for show. They were doing it for their own self-elevation. Jesus said, but you, when you pray, enter into your closet. And when you have shut the door, pray to your Father, which is, is in secret. Now, Jesus is not saying that going into your closet and praying is not becoming a closet Christian. One of those individuals that come out of the closet on Sunday morning and go to church. It's like a new suit that you put on in back and in and out of the closet. You only put it on when you go to go Sunday, go to meeting clothes. You don't become a closet Christian where you, you know, Sunday morning saints and Monday morning aints. On Sunday morning you shout and praise. You know, God is our Father. God is my Father. And then the rest of the week you live like an orphan. Jesus is not saying that. It's to go into your closet. Isaac went to the fields to pray. Jesus went to the mountains to pray. Peter went to the rooftop to pray. That closet that you go into, is it can be anywhere where you can dismiss the outside world. Get away from the distractions of the phone, the television, and whatever. And where you can just humbly, sincerely, and quietly go before the Lord. 
and pour out your heart. Several years ago, there was a movie called The uh, War Room. Mm -hmm. A friend of mine who's a contractor, he was engaged after individuals have seen this movie that to turn a closet or walk-in closet or an addition onto a house to make a war room. A place where the individual could go and just pray and be alone. There's nothing wrong with that. But when we do go to the Lord in prayer, you know, sometimes we don't have the opportunity to be able to, or the, the quickness of it, to be able to say, well, I'm, I've got to pray, but I'm going to go to my, go to my closet first. No. You don't have that option when you're going around a corner and there's a truck coming at you. The only few seconds that you might have is to, Jesus! That's enough. We don't always have the opportunity to, to go through that formality of going to our closet. And we can do go to the Father anywhere. Anywhere, any place. So let's not make a legalistic position of having to go to the closet. When you pray and you shut the door, in other words, shut out all the stuff that's happening around you and go to the Father. Because the Father knows what you're going to ask for. Jesus is telling his disciples that God knows the beginning, the present, and the future. God knows what you're going to ask for before you even come to him. And it's amazing that sometimes we get upset when we, we offer up our prayer, we pour out our hearts to the Lord, and the Lord doesn't immediately answer us. You know, sometimes the answer is yes. Sometimes the answer is no. But we really hate it when he says wait. Patience is one of them virtues, gifts of the Spirit, back in Galatians. The Lord knows what we need. And aren't you glad, at least I am, for unanswered prayers or the uh, no? How many times do we pray for something that we, oh, we've got it. And God said, no. You see, God was looking into the future because he knew that what you were asking for was not in your best interest. Praise God for all answered prayers. Because the Father knows what you will be rewarded with openly. In other words, the grace of God will be, be disposed of, will be disposed upon you and give God the glory for it. Not man, not my prayers, not my hopes, not my dreams. But God's glory gets the glory for everything. And then here we say in verse 7, it says, And when you pray, do not... You, Use not vain repetitions as the heathens. I don't know which is worse. A hypocrite or a heathen. But Jesus is telling the disciples, don't be like that. You know, saying this, the same words time after time after time. You know, and these individuals that were standing aloud and drawn, they would just repeat things just so that they would be heard. There's a danger in, in using, uh, just repeating, you know, Jesus, 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 when you pray, you know, or uh, mantras, or, or uh, just chants. You know, where some of these folks will set, in, that do the, you know, they'll sit in the lotus position and they'll hum. <laughs> you know, they're empty out their minds as they can see clearly. I got news for you. If you empty out your mind, you're creating a vacuum. And there's something that's going to get sucked in there that you don't want. What do you use a vacuum for mostly? 
suck up the dirt. So you empty up your mind, something's going to come in there. And it's usually not good. But Jesus is saying, don't use vain repetitions over and over again. It's kind of like them 7 Eleven songs. Oh, don't go there. <laughs> just, just, don't go there. They got seven words and we sing it 11 times. Or think of this when the Elijah was facing at Mount Carmel, the 450 prophets of Baal. It was a challenge between who could light the fires first. You know, you, you can read that over in 1 Kings. And the 450 prophets of Baal, they're jumping around, cutting themselves and all this kind of stuff, trying to attract the attention of, of their God. And of course, Elijah, he's, he's tormenting them. He says, well, maybe your God's on vacation. You know, or, or maybe he's having lunch. Or something of that nature. And the more that he taunted them, the, the, the worse that they got trying to figure out how to get the attention of their God. But when they had exhausted themselves trying to light their fire, Elijah steps back. Because he had the same thing. You know, they were repeating themselves, trying to get the attention of God. Yeah. Elijah steps back after that. Wet the fire down. Not once, twice. Put some more water on there. First Kings 18 says, Hear me, O Lord. Hear me. That this people may know that you are the Lord God. And that you have turned their hearts back to you again. Fire rained down from heaven and consumed the altar and the sacrifice. What a prayer. Simple, but yet effective. Don't be like those heathens. For they think that they shall be heard of their own much speaking. They think they'll be heard from much speaking. In other words, if they say a lot, maybe someone will hear them. Someone might be thinking, well, gee, that sounds it's like a preacher, you know. You know. Ecclesiastes 5 and 2 says, do not be rash with your mouth, but let your heart utter anything hastily before God. For God who is in heaven and you on earth, therefore let your words be few. You can say a few things and get the job done, or you can utter a whole long line of stuff and confuse the living daylights out of people. You can say, well, that applies to preachers too. Yeah, it does. And as you go and look at your watch, you know. Nobody looking at your watch. Right? Good. There's people that have things to say, and there's people that say things. It's important that you know the difference. And what God has to say through his word is the utmost importance. Amen. And Jesus here is warning his disciples not to be like those individuals that just talk, babble, and go on and go on, just utter just nonsense. Because it doesn't do them any good, and it doesn't do you any good to listen. That's verse 7. But then in verse 8, here comes the solution to that, to that problem. To that scenario. Be not you therefore like unto them. In other words, don't be like them. For your Father, your Heavenly Father, knows the things you have need of before you ask. The Lord knows what you need before you even ask. There comes a time when we have to allow the Lord to move in our lives. And sometimes when the Lord moves, it's not what we want. 
doesn't mean that we're to ask once and, and forget it or let it go. In other words, we need to, to petition the Lord and ask Him. But not in the same way as the heathens do, constantly repeating things. Does it mean we just ask and let it go? No. No, it doesn't. May your requests be made known unto the Lord. Philippians 4 and 6 says, Be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving. Let your requests be made known to God. And Romans tells us, Likewise, the Spirit also helps in our weakness. For we do not know what we shall pray for as we ought. But the Spirit Himself makes intercessions for us. See, we don't, we don't have to be eloquent when we pray. God knows what's on our heart and what we need. And the spirit that resides in us makes intercession between us and the right hand of the Father. Makes intercessions for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. He knows what's on our hearts. And the Holy Spirit, even if it sounds like a jumbled mess, Spirit of God sorts it all out and gives it on to the Father. And the Apostle Paul says to the Ephesian, the church at Ephesus says, Now to him who is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think, according to the power that works in us. The power that works in us is God, the Holy Spirit. There are times, situations that come up after prayer and prayer. We just, we just have to release it. Let it go. Let the outcome be in the Lord's hands. That doesn't mean we, we no longer show any care or love for, for that position or that person or that situation. If it affects our life enough that we're calling on the Lord, we need to be able to just say, okay, Lord, there's nothing that I can do or say, or I can't change this situation. All of us have been in that position at one time or another, and sometimes more than once. And sometimes if you're sitting here this morning or you're listening, you say, well, I've never been in that position. One day you will. When you pray for something and God doesn't answer immediately and it goes on and on and on and on, it gets to that point where, okay, Lord, it is in your hands. And the outcome we have to trust God with. Not be able to just, you know, say why, you know, don't plague yourself trying to figure out what God has already done. Why? Why? We've heard that numerous times. You know, a situation arises if something doesn't go our way. Trust God. He knows what's happening. He knows the future. Sometimes when an individual is nigh on to is really sick, We've prayed for healing. And folks will say, well, you know, we prayed and we prayed, joined together jointly and prayed for an individual. And they don't get better. The Lord calls them home. Well, you know, we've been praying for healing. And when that individual steps before the presence of the Lord, <laughs> they're healed. For all eternity, they're healed. Were not our prayers answered? The answer to that is yes. For those individuals that we know and love, yeah, we'll miss them. But 
think of that grand and glorious reunion when they, we stand in sinless perfection before the Lord and the accompaniment of all those who have gone on before us. Therefore, be not like those who are unto them, for your Father knows what the things that you need of before you even ask it. Before you ask, God knows what you're going to ask for. And we need not sometimes not be like the, the, the little kid, you know, that, that mom, 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 trying to wear you down. Or why can't I go? And I want to go. I want, I want you. You know, they're not using a whole lot of words other than repeating the same one. Hoping to wear the parent down or the grandparent to the point where it's oh, okay. God's not like that. The Lord is not like that. He knows what we need. And I hope your prayer life increases because the Lord has told us when you pray. When you pray, not if you pray. Or maybe I'll pray. When you pray. That's pretty correct. So, whatever situation in life comes along, we have the instructions of how to pray given to us by our Savior, Jesus Christ. Join together now as we look in the hymn book. Number 636 in the blue hymnal. I must tell Jesus. Tell Jesus all your problems. I must tell Jesus. Stand as we say. I must tell Jesus.
situation of life you were in. You may think that you're alone, wherever it is you may be. The circumstances of life have overburdened you. You are not alone. Jesus is there with you. Cry out to him. Might not make the situation better, but it's a whole lot easier going through something when you know you've got Jesus on your side. Amen. Carrying you at times. Father, we thank you for the inspiration of your word this morning. How it reveals the truth. And sometimes our shortcoming when it comes to talking to you. Lord, be with us now as we depart from this house of worship to the fields and highways and byways of life. May we use the inspiration that you have given us to share the love and of your Son, our Savior, and the Savior for the world, for those who say yes. Be with us now.